Be a faithful. You know, too many announcements for this Sunday, other than to mention to you that I offer this Mass again for all of your intentions. And also that Mass again next Sunday will be at the usual time. And then I have to go to Kansas City for meetings, so I would hope to have Mass on the Feast of Epiphany. So before I head out, so we'll, we'll let you know about that next Sunday. But nonetheless, next Sunday I'll be staying over in order to leave on Monday for the meetings in Kansas City, which takes about three days travel. So please keep that in your prayers. Every prior must go to give an account of his chapels, of the priory, of all his administrations. So that's what we do every year. And so keep that in your prayers as I also would have to mention St. John Bosco. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. All right, for the grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Dear servers, dear faithful, happy feast day, the octave day of our Lord's birth, his circumcision. And there are so many mysteries attached to this feast day. There are at least four that I'll bring to your attention. It would be good for us to meditate on and think about. The first one is in all three or four of these can actually come and they're explained more perfectly in the office of the priest that the religious says every first of the year, the octave or nativity octave of our Lord. The religious, the priest, or those in the convent and such like, they read the special readings <coughs> of the fathers after the sets of three psalms. So there are nine psalms, and on a big feast day like that, there are nine lessons. And there are quite a few lessons from the fathers, especially St. Leo and St. Ambrose, but even St. Paul, where they instruct us on these mysteries. And I just mean to bring them to your attention because obviously this is not a scripture class nor a long catechism class, but to bring them to your attention so you can meditate upon them, dig deeper if you wish, and then realize that all of these great ceremonies of the church and these feast days are so full of mystery. Yes, we can explain it away, and partly I don't like to do that because then it kind of makes it kind of blah, blase. But what you want to do is realize the mystery and then meditate on it, think about it. Understand what God is trying to do for us men, for our redemption, for the good of the church, for the good of our souls. The first thing then is with St. Paul. He's going to talk about Abraham and circumcision and faith. And he's, his main point, as you know, you've read this before, <clears throat> he doesn't want us to get stuck on the law because the law was temporary. Yes, we have laws now, so it's not as though laws disappeared with the coming of Christ. But the, all the laws that were part of the preparation for Christ, he said, if that was it, we'd all die. So there's something better, there's something more than the law by which we are justified, and it's by faith, not by the law. The law was a preparation. The law was getting all the details in place for the coming of our Lord. But after that, all of that old, stodgy, heavy law of Moses, Moses and the Mosaic law, is gone. Now, with our Lord, there are laws, yes, as we know, because there are many laws of the commandments, of our nature, and such like, but there's a justification. It's not by the law, which was what the circumcision was, but by faith. So that's what he explains, and it'd be good for you to read it again. That would be scripture quotes. I'll just give the quote to you so you can look it up on your own if you wish. Um, these scripture quotes of St. Paul are from the Epistle to the Romans, chapter 4, pretty much through multiple verses. So if you want to read that of St. Paul, read again Romans chapter 4. Now the second mystery is what we come around to again just from the eight days before, and that's the incarnation of our Lord. And St. Leo wants to push that home, that we believe this is an act of faith, but it, it makes sense, it's reasonable that God took both has his divine nature, but he took to himself divine, the human nature, and he has both perfectly. 
He says, Beloved, only he celebrates today's feast, the octave, piously and truly, who holds no false doctrine concerning the incarnation of the Lord, or in unbecoming notions about his divinity. For it is equally dangerous to deny him the reality of a human nature, or equality and glory with the Father. As we now proceed to consider the mystery of Christ's nativity, how he was born of a virgin mother, we must wholeheartedly abandon the darkness of an earthly speculation, and lest the night of worldly wisdom vanish from our eyes. That's what will happen. We want the eyes now illumined by faith. No longer is it just simply my reason that does all the work. No, I need to have faith to believe in this mystery of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it makes sense. As St. Thomas Aquinas says, the mysteries of faith, even though I may not understand them deeply, are not contrary to reason. They're above, where reason can't get, it can't understand. It's down here, reason of itself can get a lot of things pretty correct, but when it goes up this direction, it needs faith to get to God. And so he wants to emphasize that this mystery requires of us no false doctrine, no wrong ideas. To understand the human nature and the divine nature of our Lord combined in one individual, this little baby, for the authority to which we give credence is divine, and the truths we accept are divine. And whether we lend our spiritual ear to the testimony of the law, or to the prophets, or to the gospel bugle call, there is nothing but truth in those statements, especially those statements of St. John in his gospel, especially the first chapter. It's a beautiful chapter, and we say it every Mass. I, I wish that we could all have the spirit of Christmas every single Mass. So every time you hear the last gospel, you should think in Christmas. When you, when you kneel down, verbum cardo factimus, when you bend your knee that our Lord became flesh, you should think of the Spirit. Keep it all year long at the Mass. The third mystery is that of St. Ambrose, and what he brings forth, that's to say, and that is on this whole question of the circumcision. He says, So the child is circumcised. Who is this child but he of whom it was said? A child is born to us, a son is given to us. He becomes as one under the law, that he might gain those under the law. So it's just a continuation of this subjecting himself to everything that we have to be subject to. He became man. That's a big step for God. Not in the sense that he's learning, but in the sense that he had to do something he had never done before. God became incredible. He had become like us, weak creature. And then, in addition to that, he subjected himself even to the law. Why? So that he could bring us up out of the law. To help us who are under the law. To present him to the Lord. And St. Ambrose says, I would speak on the significance of his being presented to the Lord in Jerusalem if he had not already discussed it. So he says, what's important here in understanding the circumcision of our Lord is how we circumcise our hearts. That's to say, because we're so burdened by vice, we have to cut the vice out of our hearts. Now I know that's not necessarily applicable in the same degree to every person, because there's many, many degrees in all of our souls, many degrees of what we've left, where we've come from, what we've already circumcised. We've already cut off so many bad things that we brought with us from the secular world, from the profane world, from I don't know, apostasy even. But here we are, and it's still necessary for every one of us to un un unentangle ourselves, get ourselves out of all of these vices. And he says, we know that man, weak in both body and soul, is a certain proclivity for sinning, and gets inextricably entangled in various vices. Our Lord's circumcision on the eighth day, he says, signify the purging of all sin and that would take place at the time of his resurrection. And to continue the meaning of the text, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, is that by these words of the law, the virgin childbearing was promised. For he who was sinless was certainly holy. Moreover, it is shown that this really was he whom the law foretold when the angel repeated the equivalent of these words, the Holy One to be born shall be called the Son of God. Now again, just keep it simple. 
What, what is St. Ambrose trying to teach us? And what is it that our Lord is teaching us through his circumcision? The excising, cutting out of all of those vices. Because we have this proclivity to sin. We know it. Look at the year 2019. How many times do we go to confession? And I hope I've done quite a few, because that's good. But how many times do we sin? And that's too many. So what's going to help us with that in this little teaching? It's a daily examination of conscience. And on a practical level, I wish to let you know about that. So we're going to talk about that before the end of the sermon. The only other thing that we can get from St. Ambrose for the moment is that he says, For all those born of woman, only the Lord Jesus is perfectly holy. And as a result of his unique and unblemished birth, he did not feel the damaging effects of earth's corruption. In fact, he destroyed these effects by his heavenly splendor. Indeed, if we would take the text in question literally, how could we call every male offspring holy when it is obvious that many have been most infamous? Yes, that's us, right? The way we can become holy after being born in original sin is through baptism. And then after baptism, increase in his sanctifying grace and all the actual graces. And that should be our goal this year, 2020. Where we failed last year, that's the past. Let us go forward, striving to become holy, <clears throat> doing the things necessary. We should just make that one little resolution. What can I do for Christ, or what can I do to unite myself closer to him that will sanctify my soul, protect my soul once and for all? We should think about that. We should ask ourselves a question, and we should try to find a remedy, a resolution. One of those, I do believe, is this daily examination of conscience, not just at the end of the day, of our whole day, and of all of our faults, but of a midday examination of conscience on a particular fault, maybe a particular vice. Sometimes you hear the word vice and it means always mortal sin. Not necessarily. Vice is a way of um, a wound, this type of wound in our souls that can become very blatant, very ugly, very grievous. But really, it just starts like a subtle thing. And even that we need to cut out. So think about working at a daily examination of conscience, midday, 1, maybe 12, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, making this examination of conscience on the particular fault that I fall into, or maybe the most grievous one, and then making a resolution for the afternoon, and making my act of contrition. And it won't be long. You'll be free of it. I have no doubt. But it's the application. It's this excising every single day to get rid of those things as St. Ambrose says. We have to. Well, it'll be perfect. Well, maybe a couple of years, but it, will, it won't be long if we're really concentrated. Why, why is that? Because we bring with this whole action of looking at what we're doing wrong and trying to correct it every day. We bring with it a true spirit of contrition, generosity, we also are setting our eyes on a high goal of what we hope to become, rather than just staying back here and saying, oh, I can never do anything good. No, we can't. And it's through our Lord Jesus Christ, it's through an application of his grace every single day, and I can do it so easily, as St. Ignatius says, just by a daily examination of conscience from the day on my, on my particular fault. That's how he helped a friend of his, St. Ignatius, help um, Peter, St. Peter Abelard. He helped him to overcome a very serious temptation of impurity because he said, okay, work with me. You can't do this on your own. We're going to do this together. We're going to make this daily examination of conscience. We're going to do certain things, and pretty soon he was free of it. We can do the same, no matter what it is. But we have to want to do that. I think it is so simple, these type of little spiritual applications, because if we make a comparison to our bodily life, what man's going to stay in shape? Well, the man who applies himself says, every day I'm going to do something exercising. Or I'm going to avoid a certain type of food. That's the one who's going to make his goal. And why would it be different in the spiritual life? But that's the <coughs> crux of the matter, isn't it? Because we're very lazy. And often, look at the resolutions you made last year. How many did you keep? Maybe you made too many. 
Don't make too many. Just keep it simple. Keep the ones you can keep, do them well, and then you can always do others. But think about those resolutions. Did you keep them well? What happened? Well, as I say, that's the bygone. This year, what is the going, what is going to be the best thing for your soul? That's for you to do. What's going to draw you closer to our Lord? That's for you to do. And I think it has started with that little examination of conscience. It doesn't have to be scrupulous, it doesn't have to be uh, laborious, just simple. How did I speak? What was I thinking about? How did I act? What did I omit to do concerning this particular fault? And that's that simple. We can act with, act with contrition, do uh, some new resolution for the afternoon, and every day if I did that, <clears throat> as I say, we would soon be past our faults. You know, when it comes down to it, it reminds me of the little story of the caterpillar that was on the little leaves at the nighttime, and that caterpillar had been such a beautiful little red-headed cat caterpillar, and the, the wind said, you know, came along and said, shake off your caterpillars, dear flowers. And they all you know, shook, and then they closed up for the night, except one was very attached to the red-headed caterpillar. And he closed up, and in the morning, they all opened but one. And it was the one that had the red-headed caterpillar. He'd rather have the caterpillar and face his own death. But he didn't want to shake it off because it was too beautiful, too attached. And that's the way it is sometimes with our vices and faults. We are too attached to them. And that's why we're not so keen on letting them go completely. Oh, Father, I, oh, I'm so sorry in the confessional. Oh, this is terrible. Yes, you say that. But how detached are you? Would you be willing to go to whatever length possible to get rid of it? Because you hate it. You don't really hate it, you see. So you're willing to let it hang around just a little bit longer until it finishes us off. And then we're dead. That's what happens. Don't do that. Don't do that. You may be very sorry when it happens. You may do this, this, and this. You may even go to confession. Great. But then the amendment of life, the detachment, is very important and that comes with our good resolution so don't just resolve to get rid of sin resolve to pray well you know that's that's also part of it because once we get ourselves in a good state then we feel we feel free we feel justified by faith and contrition rather than by law and so now what are we going to do we have to pray and that's the way we're going to save our souls is by prayer and the sacraments and as father johnson said in the sermon today up in Arcadia, dear faith, we must be not be under any illusion that the sacraments are under attack today, and they're the source of grace for men. And uh, how many of them are fast disappearing? Many souls don't even go to confession anymore. Many souls don't go to frequent communion. Many souls don't even believe in the sacrament of matrimony or the sacrament of holy orders. It's just a joke. But those are the source of the grace. It's for us to go to heaven. And yet, we're going to start to say, no, I don't want that line. <coughs> one over there. No line over here for me. No, no thanks. Then what are you left with? So keep your sacraments, keep your prayers, and avoid sin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.